I want to approach this question um, by thinking about what capitals do, how they circulate in an economy of value and power and status. And I'm especially concerned following Bourdieu with the roles of capitals in producing and reproducing forms of inequality, particularly class inequality, because of course Bourdieu, for all his protestations to the contrary, is primarily a class, was primarily a class theorist. So I want to think about really what science-based and arts-based forms of cultural capital might have in common rather than what uh, distinguishes them. Clearly, there are important differences between arts and science in terms of cultural capital, and we've heard about several of those today. Um, but I want to it, really argue here that uh, scientific forms of capital may represent a different kind of cultural aesthetic, and I think they do. But in terms of their circulation in systems of power and prestige, they might better be seen as forms of cultural capital rather than a different form of capital. So I'm taking capital here as a heuristic device rather than a simple act of description. Because I think whether we could mark out a specific area of prowess, understanding, or a disposition as a capital, in this sense, in this case science capital, will depend on the work we want that concept to do. So I want, as I've said, to draw on the work of Pierre Bourdieu uh, because of the centrality of capitals in his work, which of course are not unproblematic, but I think because of the significance of different forms of capital for social relations within his work. So I, in particular, his central argument about the relations of power, capital, and distinction, and the connections made between capital ownership and accumulation and inequality. So I won't read that quotation out, but it's from Bourdieu, the forms of capital. So for Bourdieu, capital is accumulated labour and its accumulation in some hands but not others gives rise to forms of inequality, so far so uncontroversial. Uh, this is the kind of inequality to which we've become accustomed and which may become unthought, which he terms doxic. If there were an absence of unequal capitals, Bourdieu writes, we would be in an imaginary universe of perfect competition or perfect equality of opportunity, a world without inertia, without accumulation, without heredity or acquired possibilities, in which every moment is perfectly independent of the previous one and every prize can be attained instantaneously by everyone, so that any, each moment anyone can be anything. This is the world without capitals, without inequality. And we can note here the significance of history, of accumulation and inheritance. Bourdieu suggests that the accumulation of capital, including its inheritance, is the motor of inequality. Uh, he's, and he's emphatic, as, as is well known, to, that the only way to understand the social world is to consider all forms of capital, uh, economic, social, and cultural capital, in which economic capital becomes disguised. And capital is not a neutral entity. Its ownership and use confers advantage. And while this isn't necessarily a zero-sum game, some people gain at the expense of others, inevitably. Um, just as an aside, although I'm sure you all know this, but I think it's important to say that, before I say anything about capital itself, that capitals never operate alone. And this is summed up for Bourdieu in his formula, habitus times capital plus field equals practice, which, of course, is not transparent, and many of us have uh, looked at many times, and it may be no more than a rhetorical flourish, as Alan Ward says. But it does show the imbrication of capitals with... Uh, other concepts, and most importantly, it points to the importance of considering a number of mechanisms at work with capital. All of these terms are devices for understanding the ways that social relations work to make things. They make things like the drawing of distinctions, the markings of boundaries, which exclude as well as include, and the production and reproduction of inequality. So to think about the question, what does capital do? So to start with, what does cultural capital do? And by extension, what might a science capital do? Well, these relations of uh, advantage and disadvantage for Bourdieu are in here in large part in economic capital. 
But the basis of economic capital is hidden, or as he says at one point, transubstantiated, which as a Catholic child has tremendous resonance for me. Transubstantiation refers to the doctrine in which the bread and wine is literally transformed into the body and blood of Christ. So something that might look like one thing is in fact a different thing. It's something more than being disguised, but it has an element of disguise in it. So thinking about cultural capital, of course, it exists in embodied forms, in dispositions, long-term dispositions of the mind and body, what we like, what we know how to like, and so on, in objectified forms, in the kinds of things that we have, in um, books, pictures, also scientific instruments, which take some expertise to work, machines, and in its institutional state, which leads, for example, to educational qualifications. Borgia writes about the development of a specific kind of libido, libido siendi. Uh, I don't think he is re referring to science as we're talking about it today, but really an investment in the self, a privation suggesting deferred gratification, which involves uh, sacrifice for the long-term goal. Although these elements are often hidden, it's not difficult to see how they chime with, a current, with current educational practice. Although, of course, competence in legitimated forms of cultural capital go way beyond the educational world to, for example, uh, one's choice of friends or partner, leisure pursuits, uh, but ultimately the kind of rewards you can get. So cultural capital isn't simply about knowing. It's about knowing what to know and how to know about knowing how to apprehend. These are dispositions that have been socially acquired, but the acquisition has been lost through a generative forgetting. Bourdieu says history, forgotten as history. And in this process, they become naturalized. So one question to ask, which I was asking myself trying to prepare this, was whether the ownership of science capital would work differently in this respect. Now, it's been very clear to me uh, that it does work differently in some other respects from listening to the great papers this morning. But in this respect, I want to ask you whether the ownership of science capital works differently in the sense of circulating in these economies of power and prestige. And to consider this further, I want to think about symbolic capital. So, as I've said, cultural capital is about knowing what and how to know. And what to know, what ought to be known, is of course going to depend on the values of any given social world. In heterogeneous societies, uh, there is always going to be some contestation about what to know and how to know. However, only some definitions will get to count. Only some definitions will stick. Now, this is not fixed in time. Mike's work on the Great British Class Survey, for example, shows age differences. We see the changes. The point is that these uh, dispositions, these kinds of apprehensions are relational. They always exist in, to, in relation to something that they're not. That's how they gain their prestige, or not, in fact. Now, this process of legitimation is captured by Bourdieu and his concept of symbolic capital. For Bourdieu, all capitals may undergo a process of conversion so that they're recognised as legitimate currency or assets, just as money, for example. Doesn't, paper money doesn't have any inherent value. It's, it has a value because we all agree to recognise it. So with other forms of capital. So educational currents, credentials, for example, which are forms of institutionalised cultural capital, can work as symbolic, symbolic capital because they're recognised as granting and representing legitimate prestige. As he says, a credential is a piece of universally recognised and guaranteed symbolic capital, good on all markets. As an official definition of an official identity, it frees its holder from the symbolic struggle of all against all by imposing a universally approved perspective. Now, he may be going too far in his uh, designation of this as universally approved, but I think certainly we could say pretty widely approved. So the significance, say, of academic qualifications and distinctions and awards represents the institutionalised state of cultural capital and speaks primar primarily to the legitimation rather than the specific character of its content. It would be eccentric, of course, to claim that science is encountered socially as a legitimate pursuit and 
great efforts have been made by successive governments to keep its legitimacy central, even if C.P. Snow's predictions haven't quite turned out to be accurate. It enjoys a normalised status as a legitimate disposition, credentialised through the education system and rewarded in the workplace. So what does symbolic capital bring? Well, the ownership of symbolic capital brings symbolic power that Schwartz following Bourdieu calls world-making power, the power to name and define, the power to make your judgment stick, the kind of power that Ghassan Hajj calls the power to direct the traffic. But what's crucial here is the way that this power becomes naturalised, so that it appears not as the accumulation of labour, not as investments of time and money and work, but as a natural predisposition, a natural distinction. Social relations are magically transformed into nature. So symbolic capital is denied capital. It disguises its own status as capital. There's a magic in the misrecognition of cultures, of capital, sorry, as natural. So the academic title, for example, as Wacon says, is social magic. It looks like a recording or a recognition of identity, but it is in fact the creation of it. We might ask if the rewards or the routes out of uh, cultural capital, science for basis of cultural capital, uh, are not distinctive uh, or in relation to arts-based cultural capital. Well, are the routes in? Science capital is strongly correlated with other forms of cultural capital. And we know from lots of other educational research that being middle class gives you a distinctive advantage in educational markets. So I'd suggest not. Finally, to conclude, I wouldn't want to deny the important differences between different the different fields of science and arts literature. And I do think we can designate a scientific field. But I'd also suggest that we need to pay more attention to forms of capital uh, that hinge on forms of scientific knowledge or scientific apprehension. In the current time, it may be that scientific forms of cultural capital may command more prestige and legitimation than those attached to the arts. However, in terms of socially circulating forms of advantage and disadvantage and equality and inequality, it seems to me that competence in, appreciation of, disposition towards scientific knowledge and inquiry can't ultimately be separated from cultural capital because cultural capital is designed to show the ways that economic capital is hidden, the way that these dispositions become naturalised and the way that power, prestige, all of these forms work. In the end, cultural capital is an accumulation of an, and an ability to trade with naturalised forms of social learning and social labour. Some forms of cultural capital are easily convertible into symbolic capital. And to me, this is the crucial point, not the area of competency in question, but whether the form in question is socially recognised as leading to the right ways of being and doing. In other words, it's the legitimation that counts. And this legitimation obscures the social relations, most significantly class relations, embedded in its production. If we lose this sense of capital's place in the politics and sociology of privilege and domination, we're in danger of reducing it to human capital and robbing it of its political and analytic force. Thank you.